you know, and I know, I, I know too many senior leaders who would say, well, we'll give them a seat at the table, but not a voice and not a vote. Yeah. How would you uh, respond to that? That's not a seat at the table. No. That, that's a, that's a high chair off to the side. If we're going to go with the infantilization <laughs> metaphor, right. that's not a seat at the table. I mean, I, part of what we see across the board in effective youth ministry these days, Carrie, is it's youth ministries who are saying we're not doing ministry for or to young people, but it's ministry with and by young people. Like we need different prepositions. It's not for and to, it's with and by young people. Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. I'm really glad you're here. Hey, if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you do that. And today, we're going to talk about why young people are deconstructing their faith with Kara Powell. Plus, we're going to look at what are the real long-term implications of social media on a developing mind and a whole lot more. So you're in for a treat. And for those of you who are preachers, question for you. Do you ever wish you knew where your sermon was going to land before you got up there? I mean, is it really going to connect with people or not? Well, if you're interested in ditching your notes, finding clarity when the subject is really confusing, and a whole lot more, Mark Clark and I have got the Art of Preaching course. Click the link below or go to theartofpreachingcourse.com to enroll today and join thousands of preachers in my online community, The Art of Leadership Academy. Man, it's going to be a great experience for you. And then, hey, do you want to see giving and engagement go up at your church, there's a brand new technology that Overflow just released. It's called Overflow Plus Tap. The bottom line is, instead of scanning a QR code or filling out a form, people just pull out their phones, they tap a little card in front of them, and automatically they are sent to a page of your choosing, the giving page, the connection page, whatever. To learn more, go to overflow.co slash carry or just click the link below. Check it out. And now my conversation with Kara Powell. Kara, it's so good to chat again. Well, it's always good to have a meaningful conversation with you, Carrie. Okay, so I want to throw an honest question to get us rolling today. Not that the others are dishonest, but I don't know where that expression comes from. But anyway, people have been talking about young people walking away from the faith for decades now. Yeah. Like yeah. for a long, long time. They've been yeah. deconstructing. It doesn't seem to be getting any better. Or first, is that true? Is that a fair assumption? And second, why do you think that is? Why do you think we just see this like avalanche of young adults walking away? And are we doing anything to reverse it? I am an optimist. I yes. think you are too. I think you are too, Carrie. Hundred um, percent. But I'm also a realist. And when I look at the research on young people, you're right. It's actually not getting any better. It still seems like forty to fifty percent of youth group graduates from great churches and great families drift from God and the faith community. Over a million young people a year are drifting from the faith. And I think, you know, for us and for our listeners, it's not just statistics, it's personal. You know, these are individual right. young people. These are our kids, our grandkids, our nieces and nephews, young people we know in our churches. And in terms of why, um, you know, I'm a big fan of the research done by Springtide Research Institute. And of all the data that I saw during the pandemic about young people and faith, I think the most disturbing statistic that I saw was when Springtide did a study of 13 to 25-year-olds, and only 10% of 13 to 25-year-olds a year into the pandemic had heard from any faith leader in the last year. One wow. out of 10. Yeah, wow, wow is right. Any faith leader, Carrie, that's not just Christian, that's Jewish, that's Islamic, that's Mormon, only one out of 10. I don't know if I'm more mad or sad about that, but I'm, I'm certainly both. Now, when they isolated and looked just at Christian 13 to 25 year olds, the percentage was higher, okay. a whopping 12%. Oh my so 12% of 13 to 25-year-olds who said they were Christians heard from a religious leader. Now, that's the bad news. Let me give some good mm. news quickly. The other side of the coin, in the same study, 70% of these young people said they have a new openness to relationship right now. And so I think that is the good news, is that while young people are still drifting, while we haven't yet mobilized adults to really invest in young people, young people are open 
to a relationship with a caring, Jesus-centered adult. And so that's what we need to work on. Well, and that's a drum that you have been beating for years. And once again, in Faith Beyond Youth Group, right? What you're yeah. saying is relationship, 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 relationship. Now, yeah. I heard um, a lot of church leaders said we're calling everybody in our membership base just to see how they're doing during the pandemic. I remember yeah. that season. Yeah. Now, I, you yeah. know, I'm sure I didn't talk. Well, I know I didn't talk to every church leader, but what is it? You know, there's that, there's that kind of sense. I guess the question I'm sort of fishing around for is, is it really as simple as a personal relationship? Like, is that one of the pieces of glue that, that keeps someone stuck to Christ rather than come to this amazing pizza night or uh, hang out at a great event or come away on a retreat with us? Like relationship is, is, is so critical or is that just one more symptom of a larger problem that you're kind of highlighting there? Well, I think relationships are absolutely critical, and I think it's just one more symptom of a larger problem. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, let's put this in context. I'd I'd rather not— It's not like if we called 100% of the kids, they'd all be streaming back. Yeah, yeah. And and, and so let's talk about even in the—let's say in those situations where there is strong adult relationships, what else do we need to work on or Mm -hmm. what else might be challenging for young people when it comes to connecting with churches? Why else are they walking away from the faith? And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two quotes from two students. One young person, a 13-year-old, who's actually the daughter of a youth pastor, who said this, um, why should I tell others I'm a Christian? Christians are jerks. Right. And I, and I think that is how young people perceive Christians and the church mm-hmm. today as unkind or being even more direct. We're kind of being jerks these days. Um, too often. Now, I love mm. the church. There's so many bright spots. I could talk an hour about all the great things about the church. And there are a lot of instances of us uh, of us not not modeling the fruit of the spirit. Let's say that. Let me tell you what about another what another 15 year old said, which I think is also a reflection of what we're missing with the church. This 15 year old said, "I'm tired of the church answering questions I'm not asking." Mm-hmm. Um, so are we really listening and empathizing with this anxious, adaptive, and diverse generation? What, are, what would be an example of some classic questions that we would at, try to answer in the church that you think today's young people are just not asking? Yeah. Well, you know, I don't think it's, it's somewhat that, but it's more we're, we miss the question beneath the questions. So, you know, on any given day and any given week, young people are asking questions about what are they going to do on Friday night? And mm-hmm. what are they going to post on social media? What job they're going to get this summer? You know, whatever it might be. Those are their daily questions. But what bubbles beneath those questions, we think are questions of identity, belonging, and purpose. Mm-hmm. Who am I? Identity, belonging, where do I fit? And purpose, what difference can I make? And so how do we how do we make those questions more overt as we're talking with young people? And then how do we show them that Jesus's answers are the best answers to those questions? Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it, you know, I it's it's going deeper with young people and really peeling back the layers and understanding their true losses and longings. Yeah. Um, okay, what are some of the reasons that you would say young adults and teenagers are walking away from Christianity? Because, I mean, everybody's paying attention to deconstruction. We're trying to figure it out. It's not getting better. But I'm with you. I'm an optimist. I think we we can turn this thing around. Um, what are some of the, the stated reasons? And then you are one of the reasons I love our conversations. You're a researcher. What is the research telling us? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's a lot of what we've already been talking about, lack mm-hmm. of adult relationships, the church being viewed as unkind, hypocritical, unloving, the church being viewed as irrelevant. Um, I think one of the really interesting trends when it comes to faith deconstruction, well, first off, you know, a lot of what we read about when it comes to deconstruction is more happening in the young adult stage mm-hmm. than the teenage stage. 
And even with teenagers, though, they do have doubts about their faith. According to some research we did a while ago, about 70% of graduating seniors from youth groups admit to having significant doubts about their faith. Um, And you know, so that can cause us to freak out, like, oh my goodness, you know, they have these doubts. But here's what's been so interesting in our research, and Carrie, I would say in, in the 10 years of research we've done at the Fuller Youth Institute, maybe one of the most um, surprising uh, findings we've had is that when young people have the opportunity to express and explore their doubts, that's actually correlated with greater faith maturity. So it's not doubt that is toxic to faith, it's silence that is toxic to faith. And so in our new Faith Beyond Youth Group book, part of what we're trying to do is give adults the tools to know how to build the trusting relationships that are needed with young people so that young people can get to that point where they can they can raise the questions that they're wrestling with when it comes to God in the safe place of the church. Is certainty an enemy to faith? Is that something that is turning the next generation off? What I would say is, instead of certainty, I think curiosity is a better posture with this generation. Because when we come in with like absolute answers and black and white thinking, which seems to be on the rise among some adults, like as culture becomes more ambiguous, more complicated, more postmodern. You see a lot of people yeah. going, clarity, like a uh, clarity's not certainty. They're different. But sure. you know, sure. absolutely without a doubt, this is the way the world works and this is who God is. And I don't know. I mean, I, I sense that that isn't resonating with young adults and teenagers as much anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I- I'll say this. Some of my best conversations with young people, whether it's my own kids or other young people, teenagers and young adults, it often starts with me or them. But sometimes it's usually me saying, I wonder. (laughs) Mm. I wonder about, I wonder how your belief about this connects to your experience here. And just being curious about different parts of their life. And, you know, I think especially asking about how their faith is connected to different parts of their life. I wonder how, you know, you are under a lot of stress. You're dealing with mental health challenges. I wonder how your relationship with Jesus helps, if at all, in the midst of your biggest times of stress, anxiety, of depression. You know, I've had some really fascinating conversations with young people where I can help them think about what they're experiencing, what they believe, on one hand, what they've read in Scripture, uh, on the other, and I wonder how these two go together for you. So, yeah, I think being curious instead of confrontational goes a lot further with this generation. I can see a lot of adults over 40 hearing the question you just asked and feeling maybe a little bit intimidated by it or Mm. like, should I even go there? Because you said how your faith in Jesus helps, if at all, you know, in dealing with, and you're like, whoa, now I've opened the whole, like, they're going to start deconstructing, they're going to walk away, they're going to go, you're right, it's not helping at all, and now I'm an atheist. So, and that's what I want to explore a little bit because I think there was was a, a... a style of Christianity, a way of thinking about our faith. It's like, you know, God said it, um, Bible Bible said it, I believe it, whatever that mantra is, right, I can't right. remember on the spot, <laughs> right? That settles it. That settles it. That That's settles it. Line. That settles yep. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That settles it. There can be no room for doubt in that kind of framework. Yeah. And I'm just wondering what you would say to parents, church leaders, um, mentors who are afraid if they are that open that the whole ball of yarn is going to unravel in front of their eyes. Yeah. Well, first off, Carrie, I've been to 26 grades of school. Okay. I've done a lot of school. I have a master's of divinity and I have a PhD in practical theology. I'm a faculty member at Fuller Seminary. And the average 12-year-old can ask a question about God that I can't fully answer. (laughs) Fair. Yeah, fair. So, and... 
I don't think that's a bad thing because mm-hmm. I think if we could fully explain God, then God wouldn't be God. Yes. Like God would just be like a cool person. So, so the fact that there are elements of God that we can't explain actually gives me confidence in God's godness or God's otherness, mm-hmm. God's holy, holy otherness. So, so I see that as a powerful thing. But when that 12-year-old or that 17-year-old or that 22-year-old asks you a tough question, what do you do? What do you say? And let me just tell you, my my go-to phrase, and I've used it with my own kid and, and kids, including, I mean, maybe one of the toughest times I've had to use it was uh, one of my closest, closest friends um, was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Mm. Dire. She did an experimental chemotherapy process. It was agonizing for her physically. But I remember leaving my daughter's birthday party and stepping outside of the pizza place on May 8th of a year, a number of years ago, and calling her because she was getting results back. And as I'm standing outside the pizza place, she's telling me, Kara, the cancer's gone. The cancer's gone. The cancer's gone. Like the doctors are amazed. They, it was the results were even better than the doctors expected. Biggest miracle our family had prayed for and seen mm. at that mm. moment. Mm. Six months later, she's in our living room and she has a seizure. Paramedics come, take her to the hospital, and as they x-ray her, as they MRI her, she ha- the, the cancer's back and tumors have riddled her brain and her spine, and there's no experimental chemotherapy that's going to do it. She passes away about a month later. So went from hmm. biggest miracle our family had ever seen on May 8th, and again, I remember because it was my daughter's birthday, to six months later, a seizure in our living room, and a month after that, going to be with Jesus. And my daughter, who was... uh probably 12 at the time when she when we told her that Chrissy had gone to be with Jesus she was mad yeah she was mad Carrie and she said she said why would god heal Chrissy and then let her die she said mm-hmm. a person wouldn't even do that why would god do that 12 year old mm-hmm. and so thanks to our research this was the phrase that i used i didn't try to explain it away I just said, I don't know, but, and those are the four words. I don't know, but, and as, as Krista is the daughter, is my daughter who was especially angry as she sat down next to me and we were both crying. I said, I don't know, but here's what I have found to be true about God. And eventually I don't know, but here's what Paul says in Romans five, that suffering leads to perseverance, perseverance, character and character, hope. So that phrase, I, you know, as, as where, when we're, not if, when we're journeying beside young people who have tough questions, four words, I don't know, but, and then we point to our own experience, we point to something scripture, or we say, I don't know, but how about, let's get together with somebody in our church who mm-hmm. I know thinks about these questions a lot, and we can have coffee and ask him or her. So I, I, that phrase, I don't know, but has been game changing for me and for all sorts of leaders and families who've been tracking with our research. Well, you know, it leads me to, if you think about the style of apologetics that was um, going back to, and thank you for sharing that, by the way, but going back to yeah, church sure. leaders answering questions nobody's asking, that's something I think about. Yeah. I still preach occasionally and I'm like, I got to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm not answering a question that nobody's asking. I think that's a very real issue, and it's true in personal conversations. It's true in pulpit conversations. But if you think about how apologetics was done for a long time, it was very logical, very head-driven. I'm not sure that that is... I'm not saying throw that out. I mean, I think if if our faith doesn't stand up logically, I mean, you're a researcher, you have a doctorate. I went to school for a while, too. Uh, you know, I'm supposed. We're supposed to love God with our mind, so I'm not throwing logic out yeah. the window. Yeah. But it seems like yeah. I could come up with this bulletproof argument. I'm going to present to a bunch of teenagers, and they're going to go, "Yeah, but at the end of the day, that's just not my truth. That's not my experience. That's not my worldview. Yeah. That's not how I see things." Yeah. I don't know. Are you yeah. noticing a shift with with even in the way the next generation 
understands processes, logical arguments? The lawyer asks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I'm yeah, a logical thinker totally. too. Like I'm, I'm over, I'm overly linear. <laughs> yes. I'm linear to I a have fault. No, I okay, have no so. swerve in my linearness, Kara. All right, right, yeah, and 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 I'm married to an engineer. You're uh-huh. married to an attorney. Like know. you know, we we we've like, got a lot of logic uh, right. if, with us and our spouses, and, uh-huh. and I love that part of me. And and there are some young people who do gravitate toward that. Totally. I, I think how I would answer your question, Carrie, actually what comes to mind is one of my favorite quotes of the last few years from our mutual friend, Reggie Joyner, mm. who says this, a kid might forget what I teach them, but they'll never forget what God does through them. Mm. And so, yeah. yes, teaching teaching is important. And, you know, I want I want all young people to be taught well. Yeah. I, I want them to be taught not just what to think, but how to think. So I mm-hmm. think that's part of it. And how do you stay curious, stay growing? And how do we pair that with what this generation is hungry for, which is the chance to really make a difference, the chance not just to hear and sit, but to go and do. And so, I mean, that's what we're seeing some of the more effective youth and young adult ministries do is to to hand the keys over to young people, sometimes literally, sometimes metaphorically, and let young people take their passions, take their gifts, make some errors along the way, and really Mm. lead. Do you know, is there a style of logic slash rational arguments? I mean— You know, 15 years ago, Dawkins and Hitchens and the Christian apologists were sort of all the rage. They were sort of the new atheists. And then, you know, and that was a very intellectual, cerebral kind of moment. Do you see a a form of dialogue? Because, you know, truth has become more subjective in postmodern culture. And not everybody buys it. I, I agree. There are some who are definitely buying into a logical framework. But I guess I guess I the question under the question, Kara, is what is persuasive? Mm. Well, I'll, in our new Faith Beyond Youth Group book, we offer a five point compass. Mm-hmm. One of the points of the compass is teach for transformation. So, how do we really teach for transformation? And we have a number of principles we spell out. I think the one that jumps to the top for me as you ask that question <laughs> is the power of a good question. Yeah. And, and you know, one of the mantras, and, and I'd give myself a B at best on this, Carrie, so I'm working mm. on this. One of the mantras we, we try to teach leaders and parents is when it comes to young people, never make a statement if you can ask a question instead. So never make a statement if you can ask a question instead. Young people are getting information tossed at them, shoved at them all the time. Instead of being, you know, one other source that's just shoving information, how do we ask questions that show our curiosity, that keep young people curious, and that help young people think a little bit more about how what they're experiencing in the life relates to what they're reading mm. about in Scripture. What would an example of that be? Because, I mean, very jesus Yeah, yeah. Right? What, mu- what must I do right, to inherit right, eternal yeah, life? But- good teacher. Why do you call me good? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. like he's always answering a question with a question, which we are not trained to do. We are, you know, often if you look at yeah. senior leaders in particular, we're trained to be the answer people. That's why you're in that role. So I want to explore that. What would be mm-hmm. the example of asking a question? Yeah. Well, part of what we think is really helpful when it comes to teaching for transformation and practicing together is to use the springboard of current events. Like, this is the beautiful thing, is that every, every day, every hour, <laughs> there's something happening in the world that gives us an opportunity to process, like, what does it mean to be a Jesus follower in the yeah. midst of this? Yeah. And so, 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 I mean, we offer a simple three question framework, Carrie, uh, in Faith Beyond Youth Group. First off, when it comes to a current event, like what's happening? So let's first off get on the same page about what's happening, whether it's political, or <laughs> that religious. That takes a minute longer these whatever days it to get be. on the same page about what actually is yeah, happening. Yeah, right. Exactly. Well, that's what Sometimes you think. Sometimes it takes but a really long you, time. I've been yeah. researching this, yeah. Kara. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what's happening? Yeah. 
what's what's happening? Mm. What does it mean? So can we get a little bit deeper? And then my favorite question is, what is God inviting us into? What is God inviting me or us into? I don't know if you've done spiritual direction, Minimal. Carrie. I've, I should I've do been more. I, okay. I've had. I love. I love spiritual direction. I'm in a group spiritual direction. I've had. I've had spiritual directors, and basically, that's the essence of spiritual direction: is a really good conversation, asking what is God inviting okay. me or us into. And so, so you know, there's a pretty simple three three question framework to try to help um, think logically and also think practically. Okay, no, that's good. And I know one of the other things I do sometimes, if I'm presenting in a classic apologetic setting, is ask questions about the Christian faith. What are they What are they yeah. thinking? But then also ask questions about the alternative. Like, okay, so if this isn't true, what Paul says, then what is? And mm. are you happy with where that leaves you? So we're detached, right. we're removed, and? and then it's like, okay, yeah, I guess detachment isn't what I thought it would be. So where does detachment go? Yeah, that's even more bleak. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like you you end up in a pretty dark place pretty quickly. Somebody once said, yeah. most people's worldviews are three questions away from totally collapsing. And I think it's true. You know, so you believe nothing happens after you die, Kara. Why? Well, you know, I don't know. I just think you go nowhere. Well, why? Uh, well, yeah. you know, I don't know. I mean, you just, there's no evidence of eternity. Well, Why? And then they're like, okay, stop this conversation, please. Like, can we move on? Yeah. Like, and, and that's, you know, you're a researcher and that kind of thing. But if you talk to most people three whys and they're like, they're lost. Yeah. And so I'm not doing that manipulatively, but yeah. I think you're right. Questions are really, really powerful. And of course, the personal questions, you know, what is it? Identity, belonging, and purpose. Those yeah, three. Exactly. All right. So you yep. do open up in your new research, you talk about character. And sort of mm-hmm. t- t- talk to us about the role of character too, because I think we've seen that really strained and tested in the church. Everyone's been talking about authenticity for years, but we don't seem to be able to quote, pull it off. That's a joke. Um, but you know, the, this, this idea that people are <laughs> longing for authenticity, but it seems to be so elusive. Uh, talk about character and what the next generation is thinking about when it comes to that. Yeah. So I think there's a ton of misunderstandings about character. So, you know, we tend to think of it as a list of do's and don'ts. That's uh, that's especially how it's taught at elementary age, both in school and sometimes even in Sunday school. I think if, if I can be super direct, Carrie, I think some parents of teenagers, what we heard from youth pastors is they feel pressure from parents to produce Nice, successful virgins like right. that. Who don't do drugs and don't drink and, and yeah, and don't sleep yeah. with anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. you're right. And, that, and that's a, that's the definition of character. All that is leaves us wanting, right? And so it, it, those are flat, hollow versions of char- char- character that n- nobody's going to give their life to. Um, so the way that we define character after spending a lot of time searching scripture, as well as with some really amazing youth leaders, is we define it as living Jesus's goodness every day by how we love God and our neighbors. And so it's centered on Jesus and Jesus's goodness and it's got this practical manifestation of it's how we love God and how we love our neighbors. Um, because part of what we were seeing in, in our Faith Beyond Youth Group research is for a lot of young people, at best, faith mm-hmm. is confined to youth group. It's the 75 or 90 minutes when they're in youth group. And so if we want to have a robust faith that's not 70 minutes but seven days a week— then it needs to be connected to love and connected to living out Jesus's goodness. And that's where character is is a really wonderful bridge to help walk across toward faith beyond youth group. I think you make this argument, right? The 70 to 90 minutes of youth group or, you know, church for adults, which I imagine kids probably attend youth group more faithfully than adults attend church. So you Maybe. get a little more math in your favor in that direction. Yeah. But um, you think about the influence that social media has, that the mainstream culture has, which is decoupling faster and faster from any semblance of Judeo-Christian Christian ethic. Yeah. Um, what influence? Because it's really easy as a parent or as a leader to blame social media. Yeah. But what impact is social media having on deconstruction and people walking away from their faith? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, so, I mean, kids are exposed to all sorts of things, mm-hmm. the good, the bad, and the ugly on social media. Um, and and I think there are some ways that social media shows young people doing positive things. Uh, I do want to start with that. Like, my kids have learned a lot of uh, pro-social behaviors from social media. But yeah. having said that, there's a lot more... Um, there's a lot more toxic messages on social mm-hmm. media than positive. And and maybe even what's what's most dangerous about social media carry is uh it's it's seemingly core it's seeming correlation with mental health. If mm-hmm. you look at what's happened with mental health, anxiety, depression, even suicidal tendencies, it's right about the time when cell phones became ubiquitous, very common, smartphones in particular that some risk behaviors dropped. Um, Risk behaviors involving other people, (laughs) partying, drinking, et cetera, those actually have dropped a little bit. That's the good news. But the risk behaviors related to mental health have dramatically increased. They were increasing before the pandemic, and now, by most accounts, they've doubled or tripled. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that social media, which shows you everything you're not a part of um, and and helps you compare the worst of what you know about yourself with the best of what everybody else is projecting, I think those are some of the reasons that that social media has left young people feeling not enough, um, which which hurts their sense of identity, which hurts their sense of belonging and hurts their sense of purpose. So, I mean, what do you do? I mean, I haven't parented teenagers for a few years now, but I remember even when our kids were younger, it was a battle about screen time and gaming and the whole deal. But I mean, if you're raising a teenage boy right now, and I don't, I don't want to be gender specific, but chances are that your children are not gaming with people in the room, but gaming with people online. Uh, Is the whole like limits thing gone because social media is so ubiquitous now or uh, and and our phones are everywhere, and they're devices we need yeah. for school, work. Like, how do how do you handle that? Because you can't. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. What do you do? Let's please not believe the lie that limits are gone. Okay. Okay. So, good. All so, right. So, so, so thank you for raising this question. And in fact, I mean, it, there's some technology like iPhones. There's whole family systems where you have more control over putting limits on your kids, you can actually control more and more of what they're exposed to and how Mm -hmm. long Mm -hmm. uh, every day, how much time they get on particular apps. They have to ask you for more time than that, et cetera. So I absolutely think limits are imperative and they're important, but I would say that's secondary. What's primary is ongoing conversation about who we are as Jesus followers, as a family, if it's a home context, and and how do we um, use our phones to love God and our neighbors um, instead of for other things that aren't loving to ourselves either? So uh, it starts with starts with really good honest conversations. But then yes, absolutely, limits are are imperative. And you know we recommend whether it's through the kind of um, technology that actually lets you have limits, or whether it's limits on no phones in bedrooms at night, no phones during meals. Um, n- only a few minutes of checking your phone in the car, and then the rest of the time we're in the car, it's, we're going to talk to each other. Some youth groups try to put particular encouragement boundaries on how much kids are on phones and kind of a covenant, we're all going to do this together way. So yes, we absolutely believe in limits. So limits are not dead. That's good to know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you say to the child who or teen who doesn't know how to live without a device in their hands or back pocket. Your mom too. Yeah. Yeah. I think it goes back to identity, belonging, and purpose. And, you know, whenever that is not my kid's situation, but there are other situations where when my kid is doing something that doesn't totally make sense, it doesn't, it's not like them. It's a little askew from who they are. And I stop and ask, okay, wait a second. And by the way, this is not just true with my kids. I do this now with my colleagues. I do this with myself. If I'm acting in a way or feeling emotional heat about something that feels a little not like me, like, why is this such a big deal? I stop and I ask, okay, 
what's going on? Is this a pursuit for identity? Is this a pursuit for belonging? Is this a pursuit for purpose? What am I looking for? And, or what is my young person looking for? And how can I help them get it some other way? So my hunch is it's the young person who can't step away from their phone and has to have it with them all the time. That's probably a belonging, uh, looking for belonging. Um, there are some psychologists who think that belonging is our primary drive. It's a little bit ahead of identity yeah. and purpose. And so I, it depends on the age of the kid. I, you know, be different with a 13 year old than a 17 year old, but I'd be thinking and talking with my kid about, mm-hmm. okay, what, what real relationships can we develop? Who are some of your favorite people? How can we have them over? What would you like to do? Et cetera. Um, to try to facilitate more FaceTime to get some of that sense of belonging, not just from, not just from that, that device they have, but from, uh, people in person. Uh, synchronously. No, that's a good point. You know, if you're going to be the orchestrator of the limits, you can also be the orchestrator of the alternatives as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's that's a lot easier with 12, 13, 14 and 18 year olds, olds than it is 15, mm-hmm. 16, yeah, 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds. But that's where Carrie, like starting these habits for parents, step parents, guardians, and grandparents, I mean, 10, 11, 12, 13, like start the habits early so that it's more and more natural at that age and as kids get older. I know your specialty is teenagers and young adults, and feel free to pass on this question, but I just see it more and more. It's been around for 10 years or so, but uh, the tablet, like the iPad or the iPhone as the babysitter for very, very yeah. young children. Like literally, yeah. as soon as they can hold a device, parents are like, well, this is how you'll behave in the restaurant. This is how you'll behave on the plane. This is how, you, how you'll behave at church. Any thoughts on that? I mean, the studies show that probably screen time before the age of two is really not healthy for the development of brains. Any Any advice for young parents who maybe see technology as the pacifier? And listen, You know, our parents use the TV, so I get it. And I may have used devices from time to time, too. So I'm not claiming clean hands. But from the research, from what we know, from your observation, when you're looking at childhood development and formation, what would your advice be to parents of very young children, preschool? You're right. That's not my primary area. Um, what I would generally do when I was a parent with, of young kids is my pediatrician was pretty quick to give me what the most recent recommendations were, which was exactly what you said. Nothing before two, a limited amount of time after that. Um, and so, you know, that meant for me as a, as a working parent who, yeah, sometimes if I had an important meeting, you bet I turned on Sesame Street mm-hmm. or, you know, whatever it was for my kids. Like I, I did use it if I needed to have a really important conversation, but I had to, I had to kind of dole that out, uh, very strategically when, when I most needed that, that babysitter, so to speak, and not make it a regular habit. So I would say pay attention to what, uh, you know, pediatricians are recommending and, and align with those guidelines. Well, and imagine, you know, the reason I asked the question is what you learn in your earliest years as coping mechanisms, that, that's hard to break. Like, yeah. you know, I'm an emotional eater. Food from the time I was very young was associated with comfort and pleasure and all of that thing. So it became very easy to be an emotional leader in my teens and 20s, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's move into new areas then. Uh, it's not all bad news. Gen Z, some of them are sticking around and Gen Alpha is rising. When you think mm-hmm. about, because it's interesting, you know, in 2024, uh, the oldest Gen Z turns about 27, depending on how you debate it. So we're not looking at high school kids. We're not looking at college kids. We're looking at full-fledged adults. How do you see if they could reshape the church? And to some extent they are. What are they doing? What do they wish we would stop doing? What do they wish we would start doing? What are you seeing as far as architecting the next generation of church? You know, when we define this generation, Gen Z, there's, there's three adjectives that we land on. Um, this generation, and we, it's, these come from looking at all the research, academic and popular. This generation is anxious. We've talked about mental health. This, this is arguably the most anxious generation we've seen uh, in the U.S. But this generation is adaptive. They are creative. They are entrepreneurial. They are visionary. Uh, and this generation is diverse. 
They love diversity. They expect diversity. Uh, racially and ethnically, we crossed a line in the U.S. in 2020. In the midst of everything else that happened in 2020, we crossed the line, and now half of those under 18 in the U.S. I don't know the Canadian numbers, Carrie. Oh, very similar. Not Caucasian. Okay. okay, yeah. Half half of those in the U.S. under 18 are young people of color. Um, and so, you know, what this generation wants in a church is they want a church that's going to be welcoming of people who are different. They want a church that's going to be tangibly loving others. They want a church that's not just going to sit, but is going to act. Um, so, I mean, this is where Faith Beyond Youth Group and that theme is actually perfect for this generation, because they don't want a, a faith that's only about 70 minutes in youth group. Mm-hmm. They want a faith that expands beyond the walls and expands beyond Sunday morning. And so, um, I'm I'm very optimistic about this generation's uh, potential to show us new ways of loving God and loving our neighbors. So, if they're in, they're all in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If they're in, they're all in. Um, they, they're they passionate. They're creative. They, they're they wholehearted in, in what they do. And so um, I, I just think there's a ton of potential. They still need adults. Yeah. And, and this is where, you know, with with um, some of the work we've been doing with the 10 by 10 collaboration, we've been getting to know some amazing Catholic leaders and just coming to understand the Catholic perspective on mentoring, which is often these days referred to as accompaniment. Like young people still need adults who are accompanying them, who are journeying alongside them, but they need those adults who are um handing them the keys and open to their new ideas mm-hmm. instead of trying to control them and have them fit into what's always been done. Yeah, and that kind of leads nicely into another question I wanted to ask you, which is the average senior pastor is pushing 60 now, if not 60 yeah. years old. And yeah. it's really easy as you get older. I'm still a little bit younger than that, but you know, to go anybody under 40 is still a kid. Well, yeah. Is that really, you talked about this in previous research projects that you've done. Do we have to just throw the keys earlier? Like you think about open AI, yeah. Sam Altman's like 38. And I mean, yeah. the people who are literally changing the course of human history are in their 20s and 30s coding away. Yeah. And we're figuring out the ethics as we go along. Like yeah. in almost no other industry do we infantilize yeah. young adults like we do in the church. So, you know, rant on that or answer the question. That wasn't a question, that, that was a statement. But Doesn't that just break your heart, Carrie, yeah. that you just said in no other industry do we infantilize young adults like we do in the church? Yeah. Um, and this is where I think there's, there's deep fear of change. Mm-hmm. There's desire for control. Um, so, you know, I, I, I know that there's a lot of talk about pastoral succession. Yes. And I, I, as, as there should be, if you look at the data, I, I think it's not just about young people, quote, stepping up. It's also about those who are older making room mm-hmm. for young people and young people's ideas. And, you know, I have to ask myself, even as I've been talking with you here today, Am I really handing the keys over to younger leaders, or am I just talking about handing the keys over to young people? I, I love. I was just talking with a, a youth pastor at a church a couple of weeks ago, um, and they were they their their students came home from summer camp all excited about prayer, um, and students wanted to pray, pray, pray. And so the senior pastor said, okay, this weekend we're disbanding the adult prayer team and we're going to replace the adults with students. And so in the post-worship service prayer time, when they called up people, the prayer team, it was teenagers and young adults who came forward to be the prayer team. And I mean, the young people felt so honored by that. And here's what's awesome is the congregation loved it. Mm -hmm. Like there are now adults waiting to be prayed for or with 
a young person who wouldn't have gone forward with an adult. Now, are there questions of maturity? Sure. Is this long-term sustainable? I don't know. But like just the idea that the senior pastor was willing to pretty quickly make a change and pretty quickly pay attention to what their young people were passionate about and give them an opportunity to step forward in that, bravo to that senior pastor. Yeah. And then what is stopping that from happening? Like you mentioned, the importance of having someone to mentor you, someone to journey with you. Yeah. Uh, why not infuse 17-year-olds and 25-year-olds on that prayer team on a regular basis? Right. Or, you know, we had the youth band lead our worship one weekend recently. They were fantastic. They were every bit as good as as the main band. And I love it when they get integrated into the main band. Yeah. They just happen to come from our student ministry that particular day. Um, but you know, and I know, I, I know too many senior leaders who would say, well, we'll give them a seat at the table, but not a voice and not a vote. Yeah. How would you uh, respond to that? That's not a seat at the table. No. That, that's a, that's a high chair off to the side. If we're going to go with the <laughs> infantilization metaphor, right. that's not a seat at the table. I mean, I, part of what we see across the board in effective youth ministry these days Carrie, is it's youth ministries who are saying we're not doing ministry for or to young people, but it's ministry with and by young people. Like we need different prepositions. It's not for and to, it's with and by young people. And that feeds into the succession crisis that you hinted at. Um, One of the things I'm becoming increasingly nervous about is not only that senior leaders are not bumping out early enough, they're staying too long. But I'm wondering whether there is a supply of young leaders who are saying, spending my life serving in the church is a really good Mm. use of my life. And by that, I mean stepping into staff positions and senior leadership positions. Uh, Do you have any research on that? Or do you have any impressions about whether there's going to be a pipeline of young leaders to replace the aging leaders? on staff, or are we in for another wrinkle in that crisis at this point? Yeah, I actually don't have data at my fingertips to answer that question, Carrie, but I'll, I'll say that I'm in ministry today because God called me number one, but number two, because when I ran for student body in 11th grade, student body president in 11th grade and lost, Mm. my youth pastor said, hey, why don't you start volunteering here at the church? And he and his wife poured into me. The very first job I did was I cleaned the youth kitchen. The second Mm. job I did was I made the youth ministry bulletin with the old clip art books. Oh, yeah, I remember remember clip art. Copy machines, Uh white out and tape and all that. I mean, those were my early youth ministry jobs as a 16, 17-year-old. And he both, Mike and Christy, he and his wife were both very proactive in seeing my gifts, giving me an opportunity to lead. When I proved faithful, they gave me the next step. And so, so, you know, I think we can talk about, and we should talk about academic pipelines, non-academic pipelines, et cetera. And if we get more personal, you know, let's hold up a mirror and have each of us ask ourselves, who are we training to do our work? Who are we inviting to take a next step to grow in their own ministry development? Yeah, and if we have that engagement early on when they're 14, 16, 18, yeah. it's going to be a much more natural and organic move yeah. into ministry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, well, you're in this brand new project called 10 by 10. And uh, I want you, because we've seen initiatives come and go to engage the the heart of young people, but talk about the mission behind 10 by 10, and then why is it different than what we have seen before? Yeah, about five years ago, uh, 40 leaders gathered at Fuller Seminary and looked at what was happening with young people. What you asked about at the start of our conversation, yeah. Carrie, the drift. And we said, are we satisfied with that? The answer was no. Do we want to work together? The answer was a unanimous yes. And so for the last four or five years, we've been praying and developing partnerships and asking God and each other, okay, what can we do together that we can't do separately? 
And so from all those conversations, as well as raising funding, um, 10 by 10 has been born. And the mission of 10 by 10 is to help 10 million young people have a faith that matters in the next 10 years. So if a million, approximately a million young people a year drift, if we can reverse that and have a million more stay, then what will that mean for our country? And part of why I love 10 by 10, the name, is uh, because of John 10, 10. In fact, that's when I realized I love the name, mm. where Jesus talks about the abundant life that comes from following Him. And that's always been one of my biggest prayers for young people, that they would know that only Jesus satisfies, and that's what we want this generation to know. So now there's over 100 different denominations and organizations, uh, mainline, evangelical, Catholic, Orthodox, across ethnicities, across cultures, who are coming together and saying, mm. we might disagree on other things, but we agree on Jesus, and we agree on the importance of young people, and that's the glue. Wow. So what's different? Or, or maybe another way of saying it is, what are some of the key, just briefly, key elements of 10 by 10? Because it's like, young people, you should come back. That's not it. Like, yeah. what are you... What is what is the DNA of it? Yeah. Well, first I would say we're fully collaborative, that we've come to realize that any organization, any denomination at its very best, if it works on its own, can see a 10% change in what's happening with young people. And we want to see a 10x change. We want to mm. see a multiplicative change. And so if we want to see a 10x change, then maybe we should do what Jesus prayed in John 17, <laughs> one of Jesus' last prayers, and be the unified church. And so it's fully collaborative. We're always looking to do things together. Secondly, it's diverse, as I mentioned already. Uh, theologically diverse, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, ethnically diverse, um, Latino, Asian American, Indigenous, white, African American, and on and on it goes. And I think I'd probably add one more thing to that list, Carrie, um, not only is it diverse, but we say explicitly that we're centering leaders of color. Mm. Um, there's a lot that has been developed, and I'll say I've been part of developing in youth ministry a lot of resources that make certain assumptions about resources, about culture, geared for mm. larger churches, more homogeneous contexts, white contexts. And we're saying, when we think about who 10 by 10 is for, we think about a part-time or even volunteer youth leader at a diverse church um, who has about 30 minutes a week for training wow. at most. And so we've got 30 minutes to train them a week. What do we want to offer them? And that, I'll tell you, that keeps us concise and that keeps us real for sure. So let's say we do nothing. Over the next decade, what does it look like? What happens? Uh, churches continue to shrink. Churches continue to age. There's a new category that I've only read a little bit about. You know, we hear about the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-S. Right, I always right. feel like I need to spell that out. We've heard a lot about the nuns, thanks to Pew, and how much they're growing. There's a, a, a kind of a... a corollary there, which are the UMS, U-M-M-S, hmm. who are young people who have a church background and appreciate the church, but are not connected with the church right now. So you ask them, are you involved in church? Um, I like that. I like that's, that. That's yeah. how they start. That. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that true? I mean, totally can you think true. about young people? You know, there's a lot of ums. So I think the nuns continue to increase. The ums continue to increase. Again, I'm an optimist. So, you know, maybe God will use this smaller remnant, but I think churches' budgets are going to get smaller. And without the energy of young people, I continue to be concerned. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, it, so we, we can't do nothing. Like, we can't do nothing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the writing's on the wall in many respects. And something like 50% of churches are, are declining right now actively. Yeah. And yeah. you magnify that out over a decade, and it's it's not good. Where where who's talking about the ums? Was that just like a buzz phrase that you picked up, or is it like a oh, research group? Oh, I have group? to get back to you on that. Oh, that's okay. I, I was I yeah, it was one article I read that I, I need to I, I like need to it. look into a little bit no, more. No, it yeah, makes me sense too. because are you Christian? Um, yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah. 
Well, I was. <laughs> well, and you know, we both track with David Kinnaman and Barna pretty closely. There's yeah. a real rise in spiritual openness that is yeah. decoupled from church. In yeah. other words, it's yeah. not like everyone's an atheist and everyone's yeah. an agnostic. It's like there's a lot of, and, and you know, in some of the research, it shows that the people who don't attend church are more orthodox in some cases than people who do. It's like, go mm-hmm. scratch your head over that one. But mm-hmm. um, it is interesting. So this is not a, would you agree with the research and what your research is doing? Like this is, I think, uh, Barna stuff. But like this is a spiritually open generation. Open generation, yeah. I'm I'm surprised I haven't quoted Barna's research on that so yeah. far in this conversation. Yeah. So I'm glad you did, Carrie, because I I think some some of what's really interesting is how many positive characteristics young people in their study use mm-hmm. in describing Jesus, and then when they describe the church, not so much. Right. Um. So so yes, they're very open to Jesus not so open to the church, which is where, you know, we have our work cut out for us to earn trust back with with this generation. I was reading one study of young people. They are twice as likely to say they've been hurt by organized religion as they are to say they trust organized religion. So this is a generation that we need to re-earn trust with. Well, it's kind of back to Mahatma Gandhi, right? I like your Christ. It's your Christians I'm not so sure about. Exactly. Uh Exactly. Yeah, very little has changed in that respect. So I'm making the assumption that most of the leaders listening to this podcast want to reach young people and the next generation. Anything we haven't covered that you feel like, hey, pay attention to this before we go, make sure you focus on this. Anything else you want to say? I think we've covered quite a bit. Um, This is a bit out of left field, but I'll just share it. Um, Something that I think will be interesting to see with data, and this relates to technology, some of what we were talking about before, is, and this will be of interest to your listeners, is young people's giving patterns. Yes. Um, Because church-going young people are not seeing giving happen. You know, I remember as a child and a teenager, like the sound of checks being ripped out of checkbooks. Oh, yeah, wallets opening. Every, all, mm-hmm. all, over the, we're all over the worship center, offering bags being passed around, it being a really important ritual. And now, because so many people are giving online, and including me and my husband, um, young people are not seeing much giving. I mean, there's some data that suggests that this generation is— it, is a giving generation, but I'm not sure that they're going to give in the 10% tithe amounts, Mm -hmm. Um, even church-going young people. So, so, you know, part of what Dave and I have done as parents is really tried to talk with our kids about our giving because they're not seeing it. So, but we talk about it. They know who we're supporting. They know what we support in the church, you know, in general as well as special things. So, I think we need to talk more organically about giving for this generation that's not having it modeled like previous generations have had it modeled in front of them. You know, I hadn't thought about that because we don't have the uh, art, well, the the act of taking up an offering anymore because so much of our giving is digital. And then there are kiosks in the lobby and a lot of churches have moved to that model. I hadn't really thought through the theology behind dropping that. And you brought, as you were talking, I'm going back to when I was a kid and remembering the sign, the sounds and mm-hmm. the move of that. And then also feeling the pressure to drop something in. And it's like, well, if I drop this in, then I can't go out Friday night. And then what am I going to do? And, you know, right. we, Tony, my wife and I, we embraced tithing early on in our relationship. Very, like, it was sort of foundational. So, I mean, I sorted that out as an adult. But, yeah, you don't really think about, it is, like, I'm, I've got a Presbyterian background. You're at Fuller. It's like the fourfold yeah. order of worship. Right, yeah. like that—that that was a part of the act of worship. So, yeah, really, really good to know. And then, what do you do? You just like, all right, everyone, pull out your phones. Um, a lot of it's automated now, right? Which you want, uh, you want it automated. Yeah. So maybe it's more spotlights on people sharing the joy of giving, yeah. or maybe it's more spotlights on how money's being used. Like, I, I, I'm not trying to get us to swing back to in-person, you know, synchronous giving, but I'm trying to get us to think about how do we help giving become and tithing, ten percent, et cetera, become an ongoing discipline and practice. Yeah. For young people, when they're not seeing it, which is usually one of the primary factors to young people adopting a practice. Exactly.
Kara, it's fantastic. I always love this conversation. Thanks for being so open and just leading the field. Uh, it's called Faith Beyond Youth Group is the latest research, the latest book. You wrote that with Jen Bradbury and Brad Griffin from Fuller. And just want to thank you so much for all of your work. And tell us where people can find you online and also more about 10 by 10. You bet. So, and I want to first say that um, Faith Beyond Youth Group, we actually have some special resources just for your listeners. Oh, cool. So, Tell us about and it. we can put these in the show notes. But if if listeners go to faithbeyondyouthgroup.com slash Carrie, C A R E Y, um, I knew I was a good friend of yours, Carrie, when I could spell your first and your last name. That's um, unreal. But this You're is just, almost staff th- or family at that point. I, uh, I pretty much, yeah. But this is just your first name, faithbeyondyouthgroup.com slash slash carry. And if your listeners go there, they can get a few free guides that we've created just to help them with their teams develop Faith Beyond Youth Group. They can pass on to the youth leader at their church. Then we'd love to encourage people who want to see this new uh, curation and creation of youth discipleship resources, including resources that we developed with Barna Group for senior pastors, sermon outlines, research briefs on young people, planning meetings on how to reach young people that we developed with Barna, go to 1010.org, 1010.org. You can get some great free resources there also. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kara. Really appreciate you and all the work you're doing. My pleasure. Thank you.